Hello. I am Lauren. I am Ken. And this is Paradise After Dark. Dark, 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 dark. Paradise After Dark is an independent podcast covering true crime, unsolved mysteries, missing people, and urban legends. If you'd like to support our show and get a bunch of extra Paradise After Dark content, plus early and ad-free episodes, please sign up for our Patreon at patreon.com backslash palmahawkmedia. That's P-A-L-M-A-H-A-W-K media. And be sure to check out our website, paradiseafterdark.com. On our website, you'll find links to all of our episodes, even the archived ones, our mailing list, merch store, links to our social medias, and of course, our Patreon. I'm really surprised that our early episodes are are doing so well. I mean, I, the sound quality is not great, but the content was wonderful. So, you know, that's there. It's not what we sound like now, but give us a listen. Yeah, on cool. our website, like going all the way back to day one, 2018, when we started this. Oh, that's four years. March, We're almost four years. March of 2018 Whew. was when we started this podcast. It's been a long journey. It has. It has. Long journey. And everything from 2009 and older is available only on our website now. 2009. How long have we been doing this? I'm sorry, 2019. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, I had to get you. Anyway, also at our website, you'll find there's a virtual tip jar. And if you give us a tip, we'll give you a shout on the show. Just like... We do have a couple shout outs. Uh, Brett from Fort Myers, Florida. And then we have a long distance dedication from Karina in a little town called Guelph, Ontario. Guelph, Ontario. Ontario. I know someone who is from Guelph, Ontario. Do you? I is do. it Karina? Because N- she hooked us Karina, up. It's not Karina, but okay. what a small world. It is a small world, even in Canada. And then we have Candace from Charlotte, North Carolina. Thank you, Candace. Everyone that you just heard went to our website and left us a tip on our virtual tip jar. And we have more news. We can officially announce now that Paradise After Dark podcast will be on Podcast Row at CrimeCon. Boom! CrimeCon 2020 in Las Vegas, Nevada. You guys can't see, but I'm cabbage patching right now. Boom. Uh-uh. So uh-uh. if you are planning on attending CrimeCon, use code PARADISE for 10% off your ticket. Oh, does that mean you get like two tickets to Paradise? No? Yeah, kind of. Yeah, maybe. That's yeah. yeah, that's it. Two tickets, tickets to paradise. No, tickets from paradise. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Two tickets from paradise. Yes. Yeah, so our <laughs> promo code for this year is paradise. Use that code for 10% off. Yeah, come and see us at CrimeCon. You, anyone who knows me knows that I'll be on Podcast Row as much as I can because I really enjoy the company and conversation. Get to meet so many great people. So come and see us. All right, so let's get into our case for this evening. We're going to be talking about the case of the missing and presumed murdered Brittany Drexel. And if you've been in the true crime world for any amount of time, I'm sure that that name sounds familiar to you. But we're going to tell you the whole story. Yeah, we're getting kind of close to spring break, and it's going to be the time where kids are going to be going off, new college kids, and it's little bit different experience when you go to these massive cities. But when I say massive cities, I mean massive in the aspect of they grow exponentially these times of year. Over spring break, yeah. yeah. you get like here locally, we have Fort Myers Beach and you got uh, New Daytona. Smyrna Beach. Daytona. You got all these big places that are just these locations for this large aggregate of the population to migrate to. When it's spring break time, they're tired of being in the snow, the cold, school, it's a little bit of a break. They just want to go have some fun and and party. And sometimes someone who's not necessarily old enough to do so migrates into these places. In this case, we are going to Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, which is another huge spring break attraction. Mom, I'll see you tomorrow. I love you. Is the last thing 17-year-old Brittany Drexel said to her mother in April of 2009, over 12 years ago. Brittany Drexel was born in Rochester, New York on October 7, 1991, to her mother Dawn and a man of Turkish descent. Shortly after Brittany was born, Dawn married Chad Drexel, who adopted Brittany. In an article with People magazine, Chad Drexel is quoted as saying, I'm the only father she has ever known. We are very close. After Chad's military service ended, the family moved in the Rochester suburb of Chile. 
Brittany was a soccer star in her teens, described by family as a spitfire and a tomboy, who also loved makeup and clothes. At the time of her disappearance, Brittany was a junior at Gates Chalai High School in Rochester, New York. She had dreams of becoming a nurse, cosmetologist, or a model. She had been born with persistent hyperplastic primary vitreous in her right eye, which required several surgeries to render the eye blind. To cover the eye's tendency to wander, she wore contact lenses that gave her a distinct appearance. Her eyes, along with what her mother described as a very distinctive look, very European looking due to her biological father's Turkish descent, made her a very beautiful young woman. Like a lot of teenagers these days, Brittany had a history of depression. This was definitely aggravated in 2008 when her parents separated and started divorce proceedings. She just had emotional issues, very, very stressful emotional issues. She needed a break from all the drama of the marital woes, her father Chad said in an interview with CBS News. Yeah, situations like that at that age in time in a child's life can be very I mean, they can get you at any age, but at that time, you know, you're going through a lot of changes and it can be very tough on a child. So in 2009, April of 2009, rather, Brittany asked her mother, Dawn, if she could go to Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. Now, this is over spring break. She wanted to go with her boyfriend and some of her girlfriends, but Dawn refused since she did not know the other teenagers very well and there were no accompanying adults on the trip, which could always make a parent nervous when your child is not of age. Remember, she was 17 at the time. I wouldn't allow my 17-year-old to take off exactly. to another state. So, of course, this caused a heated argument between Dawn and Brittany. Then lasted several days. Now, you can just imagine your 17-year-old child that wants to leave, mother saying no. There's a lot of stress in the household. So, of course, this is just going to fuel the fire because she's, she's a 17-year-old. She knows everything. And unfortunately, that's how it goes. Well, on April 22nd, Brittany asked her mother if she could go stay at a friend's house for a few days just to cool off, kind of relax, take it easy. So Don says, okay, with everything going on, I agree. You can go. And the same exact day, Brittany and three friends, Jennifer Oberer, Philip Oberer, and Alana Lippa, hopped in the car and headed for Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. Now, this is unbeknownst to Don. Remember, she said no. Not happening. And now Brittany's going behind her back and going down to Myrtle Beach anyway. Correct. So Brittany makes a phone call to her mother on April 24th or 25th. There are conflicting accounts after she had arrived in Myrtle Beach where the group stayed at the Bar Harbor Hotel, telling her mother that she was at the beach. Now, Dawn wasn't concerned or alarmed as she assumed that Brittany had been referring to a beach along the Lake Ontario shoreline. Now, a trip there seemed plausible to her since the temperature had finally reached a high of 83 degrees Fahrenheit. In April, that's pretty warm. That is. For northern New York. That is. I don't know what that is in Celsius because I think they use Celsius there. But we're just going to say Fahrenheit because that's all no, Ken knows. It, it's still America. They use Fahrenheit. <laughs> it was spring break. What's supposed to be a time for kids to let loose and have some fun. But apparently, Brittany was not having such a good time in South Carolina. She had been texting with her boyfriend and telling him she was miserable and just wanted to come home. Now, if you'll remember, originally her boyfriend was supposed to come down with her, but he ended up not being able to because of work obligations. Yeah. So she was being bullied by the girls that she went on the trip with and often left alone in the hotel. Yeah, there was a, some argument about some of the clothes. They were like hiding her clothes or something to that effect. I'm Something to do with the clothes or something. I don't know what it is, but there was, they were doing certain things like leaving her alone. I, I don't know. I, I feel like maybe, I feel like maybe the girls were older. I don't know the age of the girls because it was never really described. I just I know believe Brittany's they age. were older, eighteen and older. Yeah, so I think like maybe Brittany wanted to get away. Her parents said she couldn't go, so maybe she was like, you know, please, please, please. So they just let her tag along. You know, so I feel like I, I feel that way anyway, from what I've researched and found, you know, she kind of and so maybe they, they felt like, you know, she couldn't do anything because she wasn't even 18. So they couldn't take her or whatever. So I don't know, maybe she was an outcast. I don't know. Maybe that's why she felt sort of out of place. I don't want to necessarily say she was bullied because I don't think we have any proof of that. But she definitely felt out of place. 
So on the evening of April 25th, around 8 p.m., Brittany left her friends at the Bar Harbor Hotel and walked out along Ocean Boulevard, the busy main drag in Myrtle Beach, headed toward the Blue Water Resort, about a mile and a half away. This time of year, busy is an understatement. She was going there to visit another friend, Peter Brozowitz, a 20-year-old nightclub promoter whom Brittany had known from the Rochester area and who was also vacationing in Myrtle Beach. Brittany had gone with Brozowitz to a Myrtle Beach club called Club Kryptonite the night before, which was April 24th. Now, just to clarify, she did not go down there with Peter Brozowitz. No. They just happened to be there at the same time. Okay. She just knew him from there and knew he was going to be there. A traffic camera caught Brittany walking down Ocean Boulevard towards the Blue Water Resort at about 8.15 p.m. It appeared as if she was texting while she was walking. Security cameras at the Blue Water Resort showed her arriving by 8.30 p.m. wearing a black and white tank top, flip-flops, and shorts, carrying a beige purse, and then leaving again around 8.45 p.m. Around that time, she left the Blue Water Resort. She was texting her boyfriend, John Greco, back in New York, and told him she was headed back to the Bar Harbor Hotel. The couple texted back and forth until 9.15 p.m., when Brittany suddenly stopped communicating. After not being able to get in touch with her, John began calling her friends down in Myrtle Beach to see if they knew where she was or what had happened. And as far as we know, we don't have any idea of what they responded, just that Brittany wasn't there with them. Repeated calls and texts to Brittany's phone went unanswered. Finally, after not getting any information from any of Brittany's friends, John, Brittany's boyfriend, called Brittany's mother, Dawn. Well, a side note, Brozowitz and his companions checked out of a Blue Water Resort the following morning between 1 and 2 a.m., and this is April 26th, and then they started heading back to New York. Now, he apparently left many of his belongings behind. It was almost like as if he left in a hurry, because there was stuff that was still left in the room. Maybe he was inebriated and didn't pack Maybe he forgot the stuff. Maybe it was, you know, we don't know what items were left. We just know that some of the stuff was still left there as if he left in a hurry, which obviously is suspicious. He later told the family and Dr. Phil when they appeared on his show that it was always his plan to leave in the middle of the night that night and had nothing to do with Brittany. Yeah, something about they thought they were going to beat traffic if they left in the middle of the night. Yeah, well, I mean, they had a long ride back. Plus, you figure this was a... Saturday night, they were going to leave, or Sunday, they were trying to get home in time to rest and go back to work on Monday. So they're trying to stretch out spring break, but you got a lot of drive, but they didn't want to leave early in the morning figuring they're going to hit like work traffic. I don't know. It seems to me that if you're in this busy of a town and you're leaving, you're going to be slowed down anyway if you're leaving between 1 and 2 o'clock in the morning because the bars are still open. I got to believe this place was just packed. Well, Dawn was shocked and upset, to say the least. Now, remember, she had no idea that Brittany was even in South Carolina. Dawn immediately called Chad, Brittany's father, and together they contacted the Rochester Police Department. Rochester Police contacted the Myrtle Beach Police, who started an investigation the following morning when a family friend filed an in-person missing persons report on Brittany with the police down there in Myrtle Beach. The Drexel family immediately headed down to Myrtle Beach. One thing we should probably give Myrtle Beach police props for is they hit the ground running on Brittany's case. Many times we've heard older kids or young adults go missing and the family's kind of like brushed off or dismissed saying uh, that they probably ran away or call back in 24, 48, 72 hours. But this was not the case with Brittany. Her face was plastered everywhere and police took immediate action to try and find Brittany. Yeah, you definitely have to give them props because this is a spring break town. I mean, this place blows up this time of year. And you can only imagine that this particular situation that we're speaking of is only known because we know that someone went missing. You think of how often that happens where you get a young child that wants to go with a group of friends who are older and they take off and go into this area under these same, you know, this kind of the same pretense because I can't believe that this is the only time it's ever happened. So as usual, police start their investigation and they start with the 
people that are closest to Brittany. In this case, the people she was there in Myrtle Beach with and her friend Peter Brozowitz, whom she had gone there to visit that night. Now, also interviewed were four individuals identified in police reports as Anthony Shimizzi, Philip Watson, Keith Cummings, and Matthew Abrams. Now, these guys were all sharing a room with Brozowitz at the Blue Water Resort Hotel in Myrtle Beach. Now, these four people were also with Brittany at Club Kryptonite the night before. Now, after all those interviews were conducted, police stated that no one has been ruled in or out, adding that they did not have any persons of interest. Now, hold on one second. I just, I just want to – can I just get into this for real quick? We, got, we talked about him being on the Dr. Phil show. Now, the problem with Peter Brozowitz is he was kind of brought out as the main suspect in this case. He was the last person they believe that they knew at this time to see her alive. At the very beginning, yes, he was exactly. pursued so as pretty the much the main suspect. main suspect. So let's talk about him just for a quick second. Now, he's there. He didn't go with her. She met up with him knowing he was going to be there. So they meet up. They hang out. And we, we don't know what transpired. Maybe they maybe they went to club hopping, but they, we know that they went to Club Crib tonight. And he get he goes on the Dr. Phil show. Now, this is after police investigations. His kind of name has been slandered, and people are just kind of on him. And one statement that he made that stands out to most people when they hear about the Brittany Drexel case is he said, well, I wasn't down there to babysit. Now, keep in mind, he's 20 years old, so and she's 17. He's probably figuring that, you know, she's she's still underage. He's kind of a big boy, quote. I'm doing air quotes here. He feels like a big boy. And he says this on Dr. Phil's show. Now, this does not help his situation at all because it makes him seem like an asshole, which to some extent, I mean, kind of fits. But one of the things to note also is as soon as he got back and he found out Brittany was missing and all this and that his name was there, he literally got back to New York and got a lawyer. And which is smart in his case because he was looked at as a main suspect. So with that being said, I know there's a lot of stuff around Peter Brozowitz, but right now we're at a situation in this case or a location – we're at a spot in this case to where police are saying, look, we're not eliminating anybody. You know, we're not – everybody's a suspect at this point. But P- Peter Brozowitz was basically just a complete douchebag, which made – things worse for him and you can find the clip of him on the dr phil show on youtube yeah it's if available. you just type in his name with dr phil and you can watch it for yourself and see he's just like a douche that's just like the only way to describe him but keep in mind he was 20 and his name and everything had just been slandered everywhere about this case and you know we don't know if he was tied to it or not but he just probably at this point was pretty frustrated with the whole situation so i'm not trying to defend the guy i'm just saying when you watch it understand that he had already been sought after and probably went through interrogations investigations and things like that so a search of britney's hotel room yielded little clues all of her clothes were there the only items missing were her purse and cell phone Two days after Brittany disappeared, the police obtained her cell phone records. This showed that after she left the Blue Water Resort, her phone was pinging as if she was traveling north back to her hotel. Then, all of a sudden, the speed of the pings picks up, as if she is no longer walking but traveling in a vehicle, and now she's going south. So imagine you're watching these pings and she's walking north toward her hotel and then all of a sudden she's going much faster and she's heading in the opposite direction. The pings were tracked on a path leading 50 to 60 miles from Myrtle Beach in an area along U.S. Route 17 near the Georgetown-Charleston County line in an area called the Pole Yard. The pings had stopped abruptly early in the morning of April 26. Investigators narrowed down the location to an area near the South Santee River between McClellanville and Georgetown. For 11 days, police searched this area where her phone last pinged, and they found nothing. And there was nothing for a very long time. Yeah, and this is like an area that's very similar in big cities like that where you have all this big city, you got, you know, this big spring and break area, which is crowded with people. And then when you just get out of town and get so far away, it's, it's very rural. Exactly. It's very desolate. It sort of 
from what I gather, reminds me what I could what I compare it to would be sort of like the Florida Everglades. Yeah, true. Just kind of it's like good, swampy, yep. marshy. There is these tiny little towns, McClellanville, Georgetown. But if you didn't know they were there, you would never even go to these tiny little towns. Yeah, they're I drive mean, through towns. Yeah, like you know, but you wouldn't even like drive through them. I'm talking about like when the interstate or whatever right. the main drag. Yeah, yeah. So, so you want to just take a quick break here at this real quick? Yeah, let's take a break and then we'll get back to this. Okay, so even though the investigation stalled as quickly as it started, Brittany's mother Dawn moved down to Myrtle Beach to be close to investigators and the investigation and all the happenings of her daughter, which I can't say I blame her so much. I feel like I would probably do the same thing. You know, and I mean, there's so much going on. I mean, she, Dawn, is, Dawn is not giving up on her daughter, you know, despite all the things that are happening. I mean, she has uh, another child that she has to deal with and bring with her and, and care for and think about. So she's going to move down there. She's got the divorce going on. Um, there's just like so much. And keep in mind that Chad was her stepfather, even though he had adopted her and became the father. It's like there's so, so many aspects surrounding Dawn in this case. So for her to move down there, this is huge. So mad props for her to, to really be involved in looking for a daughter. It just shows that that motherly love. Right. So now the North Carolina-based CUE Center for Missing Persons conducted multiple searches for Brittany to no avail. Now, CUE stands for Community United Effort. So this is one of those programs that they use to sort of help out in the search with the families and everything going on. There have been many searches that have not been publicized, some just weeks ago, and when requested, our organization will answer that call for Brittany. Monica Kaysen, founder and director of the organization, told HuffPost. We will be there until the end, and a resolution takes place for this case, as we do for all of our cases. On July 21st, 2010, over a year after Brittany vanished, another woman reported to police that she was almost kidnapped from Ocean Boulevard near the Blue Water Resort by several men in a van. Two men jumped out and tried to grab her and throw her in the van. Fortunately, she was able to elbow one of the men in the face and run away. Police conducted a lineup for the victim to try and identify one of the men who tried to kidnap her. She identified a man named Timothy Sean Taylor. More on this man later. In August of 2011, when Myrtle Beach authorities executed a search warrant at a hotel where a person of interest once stayed, members of the Myrtle Beach Police Department Georgetown County Sheriff's Department and the State Law Enforcement Division, a.k.a. SLED, went to the Sunset Lodge in Georgetown, South Carolina, and blocked off access to room 22 with bright yellow crime scene tape. According to Myrtle Beach Police Captain David Knipes, the investigation into the disappearance of Brittany revealed that a person of interest may have stayed in this room on or about the time of the disappearance of Brittany Marie Drexel. Authorities declined to identify the person of interest, but the manager of Sunset Lodge told Charleston's Post and Courier that a man who once stayed in room 22 had moved into the room the day before Brittany disappeared and left the hotel about six months ago. Now, this was six months ago in August of 2011. The man, according to the newspaper, is a registered sex offender who was convicted of kidnapping and raping an eight-year-old girl in California in 1983 and was known by the nickname Mr. Clean. Presumably bald. The man was later actually identified as Raymond Moody, and yes, Ken, he was bald. He was sentenced to 40 years in prison for his crime, but only served 20 years and then moved to South Carolina. Not Florida? It turns out that Moody was in Myrtle Beach on the day Brittany disappeared. We know this because he received a traffic ticket for speeding around 3 p.m. on that day. There was never any charges filed against Moody, but he remained a person of interest. Isn't that something that he got a speeding ticket? It's almost like he needed to be identified as someone in that town that day. Right. You know, so he gets 
pulled over for speeding to – it almost documents that he's there. Well, yeah. But I'm saying if he never gets a speeding ticket in that town, he's never – They would not just, have known he was there. That's – that I just find that to be a little odd. So sometimes in a missing person's case, I just try to look at those little things and say, you know what? What's the universe trying to tell us? Maybe, but we still don't know. Now, in March of 2012, bones were found in an area where Brittany's phone last pinged, but they later turned out to be animal bones. Now, a group of fishermen found the bones near the Carroll Campbell boat landing. Now, according to the Georgetown City Police Department, hunters have been known to dump deer carcasses in the waterway. This is really common in areas where you have really large aggregate of a hunting community. I know in Texas, same thing. You throw them in the river, fish eat them, birds come down and pick them up. It's a good way to dispose of the carcass and almost like recycle, if you will. Because I've heard different reports on this. People saying, oh, why do hunters do that? You shouldn't do that. And it's, it's normal. It's okay. It's okay. Now, in December of 2013, more bones were found. This time... They were determined to actually be human and were found approximately six miles from where Brittany was last seen in 2009. Now, they were found by someone walking in the area of the Tidewater Drive near Waccamaw Boulevard in Horry County. The location of the discovery is a rural area and would likely be better known to locals than outsiders. A month later, it was announced the coroner in Horry County has used dental records to rule out Brittany as a match, and they actually believe them to be the remains of that of a male. So, in June of 2016, the FBI, which had also been involved in the case, announced at a news conference that was being held in McClellanville, the small fishing town about 60 miles south of Myrtle Beach, which we discussed earlier, that they believed that Brittany Drexel had been murdered shortly after her disappearance. She had been abducted from Myrtle Beach to somewhere in the vicinity of Georgetown, where the cell phone pings had ended, held a captive for several days, and killed. The agency had not found her body, nor witnesses to confirm Drexel's death. So how did they come up with this conclusion? Yeah, good question. What we've come to discover through the course of this investigation now is that Brittany Drexel did leave the Myrtle Beach area, said David Thomas, special agent in charge of the FBI in South Carolina. We believe she traveled to this area around McClellanville, and we believe that she was killed after that. It is very difficult, but the public needs to know, the family needs to know, Thomas said. The FBI also announced a $25,000 reward for information on the case. People came in contact with her, saw her, knew that she was here, so we know that there's information in the community here, Thomas said. Thomas declined to elaborate on how the FBI uncovered the information or why they believe she is no longer alive. He said he was unable to get into the details of the investigation. Brittany's family was present at this press conference, but had already been given this information earlier in the day. After seven long years of waiting and praying for the return of my daughter, we know she isn't coming home alive, said Don Drexel. Brittany's life was stolen from her in a brutal and senseless fashion. So at this point, how does the FBI know this? And they're so confident in this theory that they're going to announce it at a press conference that Brittany was kidnapped, taken from Myrtle Beach, and killed within a few days after going missing. Sounds to me like they have some information on the investigation that maybe they're not putting out there to the public. Well, Lauren, to sort of maybe explain it to you, in August 2016, FBI agent Garrick Munoz gave the first detailed account of what investigators think happened to 17-year-old Brittany Drexel after she disappeared in 2009. Now, this came out during a bond hearing in federal court stemming from a charge against Deshaun Taylor for robbing McDonald's in 2011. Now, Deshaun Taylor. This is not Timothy Sean Taylor. This is Deshaun Taylor. Correct. Who is Timothy Sean Taylor. Remember we talked about Timothy Taylor earlier. Yes, and you said we'll get to it later. I guess this is later. This is later. So we're now we're talking about there's a bond hearing stemming from a charge against Deshaun Taylor who is Timothy Taylor's son, 
for robbing a McDonald's in 2011. Correct. And Munoz's account, contained in federal court transcript obtained by the Post and Courier, and is based on a statement from a prison inmate who claims he was present when she was killed. Now, in the transcript, Munoz testifies that the inmate, Taquan Brown of Walterboro, told investigators he went to a stash house in McClellanville area in the days after Drexel was abducted. Now, this is kind of an old rundown trailer manufactured home that's out in the woods. And like I said earlier, they believe that this was a work of locals who would know this area. And you would have to kind of know this area to find this stash house. And he called it a stash house. And for anybody who doesn't know, a stash house is basically like a house or a mobile home or some place where weapons or drugs or supplies. Or someone who's maybe being trafficked. Ill- illegal activity. Things are hidden. Yeah. Like no one actually lives at the stash house. It's just kind of where they stash stuff. And usually it's not just like a group of people. It's like one group of people who stash stuff there. It isn't like everyone goes there. They just put your stuff there to be fine because remember you're dealing no, with your crime yes. element. Yeah. So – he, he claims that as he entered the house with a couple of other men, he saw 16-year-old Deshaun Taylor. Now, that, like Lauren said, this is the son of Timothy Taylor, who, again, Lauren mentioned earlier, he was sexually abusing Brittany Drexel. Now, this is what the agent said while he was testifying, that he had been told. Now, the FBI agent gave the following account of what the inmate said happened next. He said he spotted others also in the room with the girl and Deshaun Taylor, And he kept walking through the house into the backyard to give some money to Deshaun Taylor's father. Again, this is Timothy Taylor. Now, as the two walked and talked, Drexel ran out from the house. And I guess they they made chase. They caught up with her. And Brittany was pistol whipped and then taken back inside. Now, he claims that he heard two shots ring out. And the inmate assumed Deshaun Taylor shot the girl. Then the girl's body was wrapped up and taken away because he claimed that he had seen all of this transpire now when asked what happened to the girl's body the fbi agent testified that it has not been found but that several witnesses have told us miss drexel's body was placed in a pit or a gator pit to have her body disposed of basically eaten by gators now munoz told the court that investigators have searched several alligator ponds to no avail now he said investigators have been told that the area is peppered with as many as 40 of these particular alligator ponds Investigators also have searched the stash house. Now, this is what the agent testified again on court. He's saying, okay, look, we've done this. This is what happened. And we've gone to the stash house. We found nothing. And again, like Lauren said, these these alligator ponds that they're talking about reminds us of basically three, three miles down the road from our house. I mean, it's – and people don't realize when you get into these alligator ponds, these swampy areas where alligators exist, there's usually constant muck, water – and like we learned about in the Brian Laundry case, it does not take long for a body to decompose in these areas. And be eaten by wildlife. Correct. Because now you're in an, an area where you're – exactly. You've got the wildlife. You've got the elements. And we're spring break, so things are heating up. It, things can happen really fast in these areas, a which can make it – A body can be gone pretty quickly. Exactly. And – they did bring in cadaver dogs. This is not actually in our timeline here, but uh, I did watch – what was the name of the show I was watching? It was called uh, Spring Break from Hell. It, it was a, I, I did watch a documentary. I can't remember what it was. I'll put it in the show notes when I figure it out. Okay. But they – in this show that we watched, they did talk about bringing in cadaver dogs and – bringing the dog on a boat. Now, the the dog alerted in several areas over like a mile-long portion of the river. So, And the, the handler of the dog said that it is very possible that if a body had been scattered by animals, it, the, the dog would alert to all of these. So... Keep in mind also that you've got cadaver dogs out there. Now, this area you're dealing with, like we talked about earlier, is not too far from a very populated area certain times of the year, which is uh, – and if you watch, there's shows on Netflix. There's like uh, – it's called Dope. 
nar I mean, all these different shows where they talk about how drug dealers and um, kidnappers, well, not kidnappers, but sex traffickers, they go to these particular areas certain times of the year. They focus on these areas, whether it's Mardi Gras at the time of Mardi Gras, you go to Louisiana, you go to you know South Carolina for spring break, Daytona. They go to these high populated areas where you got a lot of spring breakers coming in. So these areas, if 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 something goes wrong and a let's say you know I'm a bad guy and I kill somebody, I'm going to take them out in the woods. I'm going to dump them. So keep in mind that if they take these these cadaver dogs out in these boats and they're starting to alert on things, it doesn't necessarily mean they're finding Brittany. So if they're alerting, we don't know. Maybe there's somebody else who's missing a family member that could you know that 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 could be getting alerted on. Because again, when you're dealing with these high populated areas at these particular times, this is prime picking. It's almost like ripe fruit for all of these really awful criminals, whether it be the drug dealers out there selling crack and the fentanyl lace stuff that we're hearing about now today, or there's you know taking somebody's daughter to go into the sex trafficking, which we hear about in in, in this genre so much. It can happen, and so, of course, when they take them out, if the dog is hitting everywhere, they've got to check every single one of those out because it might not be the lead to Brittany, but it could be the lead to another case they're working on. So keep that in mind when you're watching some of the shows that, you know, the documentary that talks about these dogs going out on these boats because it could have been so many other cases being solved. So uh, let's take a quick break, and then we'll come back, and we'll get right back into this. Okay, and we're back. So Taquan Brown's story was corroborated by tips from people with, quote, tidbits and secondhand information, including another inmate in the Georgetown County Jail. This inmate provided authorities with more details of what he was told happened to Brittany. The Georgetown prisoner told authorities that Deshaun Taylor picked Brittany up in Myrtle Beach and took her to McClellanville. There, he showed her off, introduced her to some other friends that were there. They ended up tricking her out with some of their friends, offering her to them and getting into a human trafficking situation, the FBI agent testified. By that point, the prisoner said searches for the missing teen had generated massive public media publicity. That created a problem for her abductors. So she was murdered and disposed of, the agent told the court. Hmm. So this is somebody else that's basically telling a little bit different story. The same story, just a little bit more detail. Exactly, but not the whole, you know, murdered, wrapped up, dumped in a pond. Well, there, he's basically telling them why she was dumped in a pond, because the massive media the publicity oh so they so you're saying that what happened is they once they kidnapped britney that they weren't expecting the media to take hold of this so quickly right and they got scared panicked and like hey we've got to do something so we don't get busted i think that maybe that she was taken for a human trafficking type situation but then there was so much media on of it on it they had to just i get what you're saying because you know I could see where they would be so scared that they would definitely do that. The only concern that I have in this situation is when you're dealing with jailhouse informants, you don't know exactly what you're getting. Are you getting information because they somebody wants to come clean and say, look, I've done some bad things in my life, but I know some things that could help somebody out that might make me feel better. It's not, you know, and I tell you what. While you're at it, won't you give me a little less time? We don't know what was agreed to in these situations. Um, so I always I always take jailhouse scenarios with a grain of salt. Yeah, you have to. So, but you also have to look into them and you also have to investigate them as, okay, well, this is a possible lead. So let's check it out because when you have nothing – Anything you get will feel like something until you basically go down that path and find out there's nothing there. And you're like, okay, well, if you can't leave any stone unturned in these situations, especially when we're dealing with a minor child and they're missing and you're trying to find them because investigators in this case, I believe, did and have done everything they can to this point. But one of the problems that you have when you take this information from – a someone who's at a bond hearing, you run into the situation like we have here. Because as we mentioned, 
FBI agent Garrick Munoz testimony came out during a bond hearing now on an unusual charge, interference of interstate commerce by threat or violence for his involvement in a 2011 robbery of Mount Pleasant McDonald's restaurant against Deshaun Taylor, as we talked about earlier. Taylor's attorney, David Ayler, characterized Munoz's testimony in the transcript as clearly nothing but a squeeze job designed to pressure Taylor into confessing. Now, Ayler argued that despite the jailhouse confession, investigators have not been able to generate any hard evidence or cooperation from others who reportedly saw the girl. As a result, he said federal prosecutors pulled out an unusual legal tactic in an effort to force Taylor's cooperation. This is what gets me a little bit. Okay, so follow along here. What you need to know about this case, the robbery of the McDonald's. Yeah, clarify. So during the robbery... Deshaun Taylor was the getaway driver while two others held up the restaurant, one wounding the store manager with two non-life-threatening gunshots. The gunman got 25 years in prison as his sentence, and the other robber got six years suspended after serving 10 months. Taylor had actually confessed, cooperated with state authorities, and was sentenced to probation, which he had already successfully completed at the time of the federal charge. And the federal charges, which include use of a deadly weapon, carry a potential life sentence. But, I know you're thinking, isn't that double jeopardy? That's what was my question. He was already convicted, sentenced, and served his sentence. How can he be charged again? Explain. Well, under federal law, prosecutors have the authority to bring parallel charges when federal laws are violated along with state laws. But this was not parallel. This was later. Hmm. This was much later. This parallel means happening happening at the same time. So you can have state and federal charges at the the same same exact charge happening. Okay. Winston Holliday cited a federal law that states that the federal government may bring charges for a crime if it is believed the state prosecution led to an unfair outcome. In this case, Taylor being sentenced to just probation and the others serving prison time doesn't seem very fair. Hmm. Now, Ayler, Taylor's lawyer, said he shouldn't be punished for something he's already done his time for and accused the government of trying to, quote, squeeze him for something they can use to solve the Drexel case other than the testimony of a jailhouse rat and another guy in jail who heard a story. Even Holliday, the federal prosecutor at the hearing, admitted to the judge that the suspicion in the Drexel case were among the government's reasons for having brought the new charge for the conduct South Carolina had already sentenced Taylor for. Hmm. Despite overwhelming evidence against Taylor and the high likelihood of conviction and possible life sentence, the government offered Taylor a plea deal. As part of the plea bargain, Taylor was told he could share, quote, truthful, substantial assistance to law enforcement regarding Brittany Drexel's case in return for a lighter sentence. Taylor took the deal, pleaded guilty on federal charges in, a, in the 2011 McDonald's robbery in Mount Pleasant. And in 2017, Taylor agreed to meet with the FBI for a polygraph test. Initially, according to court documents, Taylor confirmed that he never saw Drexel in person and only saw pictures of her in the news media. He did tell the FBI he overheard an argument between two people concerning a time when one of those people was accused of having Britney's cell phone. He told the FBI he thought the argument was suspicious. Now, during his polygraph test, which was conducted on June 4th of 2017, Taylor was asked questions including, Do you know for sure who was involved in the disappearance of Britney Drexel? And, did you ever see Brittany Drexel in person? Court documents show that Taylor answered no to both questions, but the polygraph results showed deception indicated when he answered them. I I get frustrated with this because I am one of those. I do not like polygraphs. I don't think I would ever take one, whether I was innocent or guilty. But, it's almost like you just feel like this guy is just so dirty. 
You the know? documents state that Taylor was given the opportunity to meet with his lawyer, and his lawyer agreed that he failed the polygraph test. Well, imagine that. But his lawyer allowed the FBI agent to continue with hmm. the interview. At the time, according to the documents, Taylor became angry and belligerent, which ended the discussion. So that's it. He gets mad and they're done? Because the government believed that Taylor did not hold up his end of the bargain, remember the plea bargain, he was supposed to provide Mm -hmm. substantial, truthful information about Brittany Drexel. So he did not hold up his end of the bargain. He did not provide truthful information. The government recommended he receive at least the minimum sentence, which was 10 to 20 years in prison for his crime. For the McDonald's. Robbery. Exactly. This has which nothing, has nothing to do with Brittany Drexel. Yeah, they're just they're trying to get information from him because they have information about him in this case. So they feel like he was involved with Brittany Drexel, which if you go back to the beginning, she left her mother Dawn and Chad, who were going through a divorce, to go to Myrtle Beach. And with that being said, there's nothing mentioned of Taylor. He was she didn't go with him, she wasn't texting him which is possible that maybe he had grabbed her for sexual trafficking. Maybe he um, offered her some drugs. And maybe he just kidnapped her to do some of the things that we talk about in some of the other cases we cover. So before the sentence hearing was scheduled, Taylor was found to have violated the terms of his bail and was held in the Charleston County Jail. But in August 2017, Presiding Federal District Judge David C. Norton ordered Taylor's bail reinstated on the condition that he remain on house arrest until the U.S. Supreme Court decided the case of Gamble versus the United States, a constitutional challenge to dual sovereignty doctrine, which allows separate state and federal prosecution for the same criminal offense, what Lauren described earlier. Now, Gamble versus the United States is similar to Taylor's case in that defendants claimed he was tried twice for the same crime – once in state court and then in federal court. So this is kind of what we were describing earlier, and this is an actual case, Gamble versus United States. So in June of 2019, the Supreme Court decided Gamble in favor of the government, meaning upholding dual sovereignty and allowing the federal government to proceed with its case against Gamble and against Taylor. Six months later, Judge Norton sentenced Taylor to time served, which was 319 days. So it appears that the authorities have done everything they could legally do to get information from Deshaun Taylor, and they are pretty much still right back where they started. Yeah, I feel like I feel like we need to praise law enforcement in this case because, I mean, they, they, they've done – Everything they can, they've worked this case properly. I mean, there is no mention from Don, Chad, or any of the family uh, with anything negative to say about law enforcement. I think law enforcement has definitely put their best foot forward in this case. But unfortunately, you know, I mean, nothing is coming back to them. They're, they've tried. They've checked all the leads. I think they vetted everyone they could vet. And I honestly think that they know exactly what happened. And it looks here in this case that they've they've traveled that road as far as the legal system will allow. It's frustrating for us to sit here and talk about it where we feel like this is a missing person and we want to get some answers for the family, uh, some closure, if you will. But we just can't get over that last little hurdle. And I think that's right where we are. And I think that's where law enforcement gets frustrated. So I'm, I'm, I got to say, like Lauren said earlier, props to law enforcement in their work in this case. I do have one question, and I've, I've asked this question before in other cases, and it's so hard for us to sit here and, and to, to ask. I mean, it's hard for me to ask this question, but I, I seriously have to know, do you really want to know what happened? If there's no end result, if it's just a missing child, do you feel like you want to know what really happened if if the the details are as hor- I would have to know if the details are as horrifying as what was being said that Taylor had done ha- with her in this stash house I would have to know okay I just have to ask that question and I, I would love for some of our listeners you know if to tell us how you feel in this case I mean I'm, we legitimately have a 17 year old daughter exactly we I also know, have a 21 year old daughter I want to know what 
We you have two would daughters. Do. I get it. Let me ask you. <sighs> you know, would I, you want to know? But I'm on the fence, which is why I'm asking because you know Brittany is still missing today. I mean, her body has never been found, and no one has ever been charged in her disappearance, and she's presumed murdered by all law enforcement and everyone surrounding this case. They have talked to everyone. Now, when I first started investigating this case, I started thinking, well, if those girls were bullying her, what if they did something? Well, then you start finding out this information about the Taylors, the son and the father, and what they were involved in, the the nasty things that they've done that we know of. And it's like, okay, well, that's a good possibility, but it was a jailhouse informant that gave him the information, so we, we can't make that connection. But then I think to myself, depending on which way you go, it could be, you know, she was left there and something happened, be hit by a car or somebody, you know, disposed of. I just don't know if I could bring in all the horrifying details if they were that bad. Or if you just want to think to yourself that maybe, just maybe at one point in time, she's just, she's, she's missing. And then all of a sudden you, you get the result that we had in the Ariel Castro case where she's like, Hey, it's me. Do you know me? I'm 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 Amanda Berry. I'm I'm the girl in the news. And it's like you you know what I mean? So I I I don't know. I twist and turn on this. This case here really is is kind of horrifying because again, we have a 17-year-old and I'm really curious as to what our listeners feel. But anyway, with Brittany Drexel, again, she's still missing. You know what I mean? Again, if you see something, say something. So Her body's never been found. No one has ever been charged in her disappearance and presumed murder. So if you have any information about the disappearance of Brittany Drexel, please call the Myrtle Beach Police at 843-918-1382. That's 843-918-1382 or the FBI at 1-800-CALL-FBI. And that's going to be it for tonight. Yeah, so again, like we said, folks, if you know something, say Say something. something. Don't be scared to ask questions. I mean, if you know somebody that lived in that area at that time, ask them a question. If you, you know, know someone who maybe visited there at that time frame, you know, did you hear about this story? You never know the kind of information that can get dug up just by asking a simple question and triggering an old memory. All right. Again, if you'd like to support the show, please subscribe to our Patreon at patreon.com backslash palmahawkmedia. That's P-A-L-M-A-H-A-W-K media. And check out our website for links to all of our social media, our Patreon, and our merch store. And don't forget, when you're buying your CrimeCon tickets, use code PARADISE for 10% off your ticket. Dun, 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 crime con. Crime con 2022 is in Las Vegas, Nevada. I am excited. April 30th through May 1st. And I'm, we are so excited to see everyone. So everyone, I really, really, really want to thank you so much for listening. To Paradise After Dark. Dark, 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 dark.